Good evening. It's awesome to be in God's house tonight, amen? Awesome. So I don't have any announcements for you guys. All the announcements you need will be in the bulletin. There should be some out on the welcome desk for you guys. Um, But yeah, it is just great that we get to be here in God's house. Let's go before the Lord in prayer and get into some worship. Dear God, we just thank you so much that we get to come together and be in your house. What an honor it is to be your people called by your name, God. We pray that as we come before you and as we offer up some worship, that it would be pleasing to you, God. You've been so good to us and been so faithful to us. And even the times we don't see your faithfulness, God, you are still faithful, Lord. So may we praise you and honor you in the way you deserve as king of the universe. And Lord, as we open up your word tonight, speak to us. We're here. Our ears are open. Speak to us, Lord. We are desperate for you. So Lord, we thank you so much for this time. May it be precious. May we be changed. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and worship. Jesus. 
Jesus, the name above every other name. The only one, come on. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Can we lift our voices and say, holy, sing in holy. Open up my 
sing a song like this, God. Lord, in times that are good and restful and peaceful, in times that are turbulent, the testimony of the saints of God is the same. I'll put my trust in you alone, O God. Some trust in horses and some trust in the arm of men. But God, our trust tonight is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you for that tonight, that, Lord, it's not just the words of a song. Lord, your scripture declares that you are the firm foundation. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So, God, we thank you for that. We thank you for the confidence that we can have in you, O God. We thank you that, Lord, you are consistent. You are perpetually consistent. So, God, we come to you tonight with a sense of security. Our security is not in ourselves. It's not in our abilities. Security is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you so much for that tonight. Thank you so much for that tonight. And God, we give you praise. God, we give you praise tonight, God. Give ear as we turn our hearts to you, Lord God. Encourage your children tonight. Father, we pray tonight, Lord, with Noemi and her family, Noemi and Ed and the family. As Lord, just last night, Noemi's father took residence with Jesus. Tonight, we ask you to strengthen them, O God, as, Lord, they're on their way back from New Jersey to simply turn around and go back there again in a few days. God, strengthen them. And Lord, as they celebrate his life, and as they look forward, O God, to gathering with family and friends in the days to come, God, may their memories be sweet, and may their celebration, God, Honor this gentleman, God, who has made such an impact. Tonight, God, we pray for Betty Dommel. And Lord, Betty is in need of the strength of Almighty God. So we ask you, God, to help her and strengthen her, God, in in every way. Lord, where there are challenges physically, God, would you be her portion tonight? Would you be her strength? And God, would you remind her, oh God, of how much you love her. Lord, she's walked with you for years. Tonight, God, may there be a fresh reminder to Betty of how much Jesus loves her. God, there are so many who need prayer tonight, God. Mary needs our prayers, and so many, oh God. So tonight, would you just send your word? And God, as we pray, Lord, week after week, we ask you, oh God, to touch those who have walked far from you. Lord, those who have strayed, who those who, in the words of Scripture, once tasted of the heavenly gift but who walked away. God, tonight, rescue them, we pray. Lord, bring them back to you. Remind them, even in the hours in which we pray, remind them of the goodness of God. Remind them of what it was like to feel your presence and to walk with you. And Father, we pray for their restoration tonight. And God, 
that their relationship with you would be better than it ever has been. God, minister. Lord, throughout this building tonight, as we honor the name of Jesus, Lord, be glorified in all, in all, in all that is said, in all that is done. So, God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks again. And we commend all of this to you, Lord, tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, God. In keeping with the theme of this last song, would you sing this with me? I think it'll be in the same key. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Can we sing it again? And there is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you we have to sing it again there is nobody like him amen and there is none like you I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Hallelujah. There is none like you. Glory to God. Can we just worship God this evening. Thank you, Lord God. We thank you, God, for your presence and for your kindness and for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for your compassion, oh God. We thank you for your patience with us. We thank you, God, that your word reminds us that you are our ever-present help in the time of trouble. We thank you, God, that the testimonies of your word are true. They're true, God. And they remind us of the mercies of the Lord that are new every single morning. Father, we're the recipients of this abundance of this grace, oh God, that helps us to call you Father tonight, helps us to call you Savior, helps us to call you friend. And God, we thank you for that tonight. So God, we honor you. We honor you. We worship you. We praise you, oh God. And we give glory unto your name alone. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Would you sing it again one last time? There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for I could search for all eternity long and I could search for all eternity long and find that there is none like you and there is none like you. Thank you, God. Thank God it's true. Amen? 
Praise God. Good to be together in his house. I'm going to ask you to be seated. Joe and Nancy, thank you for leading us in worship tonight. Thank you very, very much. It's good to be together. I only want to share uh, one update with you. As you know, next Wednesday night, we were planning to have our water baptismal service. But we have some people who could not make it next uh, for the baptismal classes on Wednesdays or for the baptismal service. So as we've announced uh, already, we're moving the baptismal service to uh, next, not this Sunday, but the next Sunday, first Sunday in September. I want to encourage you to be with us. Great celebration that Sunday. We'll be celebrating together what is often called the ordinances of the church. So we'll have a great time of worship. We'll share together around the table of the Lord in communion, and then we'll be going into the waters of baptism here in the sanctuary. It won't be outside. It'll be right here. So uh, please be prayed up. We're looking forward to just a great, great time together. Praise God. I want to take us tonight just briefly into the word of the Lord. Uh, as I've shared so many times uh, regarding our track reading program, if you're not involved in it, there should be some more of the reading outlines in the foyer. We want to encourage you to take those. We're almost at the end of the book of Proverbs. I'll give you a little sneak peek into September, if I remember correctly. We're going into Romans, uh, so we're looking forward to that. Romans is next, right? Yeah, we're going into Romans next and uh, looking forward to all the Lord has for us. As we have been reading in the book of Proverbs, again, for me, I've just found it exciting and refreshing. And tonight, I just a couple thoughts with you, uh, being mindful of our time, I want to share a couple thoughts with you from the book of Proverbs, largely from the book of Proverbs, and we'll be looking at other places. But one verse in Proverbs will be our springboard for what we want to consider tonight. I want to talk to you about the preservation of the heart. Proverbs, these 31 chapters of Proverbs, has been a source of wisdom and inspiration to people of all generations for many, many, many years. It's one of those go-to books when someone is in need of a quick word of encouragement or instruction or inspiration, of hope, of rebuke, of insight, and certainly, again, for wisdom or wise counsel. It is and has been a source of strength, a source of warning, a source of caution. It has been a source of revelation for anyone who has been courageous enough to thumb through the pages of the book of Proverbs and listen to and adhere to and embrace the truths that God has given. While every single chapter in Proverbs, I'm going to stand if you don't mind, while every chapter in Proverbs is packed with all sorts of of goodies. I want to draw attention tonight primarily to Proverbs chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs 4. Um, and I want us to read, I want to read through a good bit of Proverbs 4. I'm reading from the New International Translation, and I'll try not to give commentary on too much because we certainly will not make it in due time tonight. If we do, i uh, go beyond that, then we'll turn it into a series and pick it up next Wednesday. Proverbs chapter 4, beginning of verse 1. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. When I was a boy in my father's house, still tender and an only child of my mother, he taught me and he said, lay hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Listen to this. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. Esteem her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will set a garland of grace on your head and Present you with a crown of splendor. Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction and do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Verse 14. 
Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it and do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. For they cannot sleep till they do evil. They are robbed of slumber till they make someone fall. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. Listen to this. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet. And take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right nor to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Please go back to verse 23. Perhaps the most familiar verse in this entire passage. The writer of Proverbs said, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is a wellspring of life. Very quickly, I want to go back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, and read to you just the first nine verses, landing on verse 9. Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you. And do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God, uh, that the Lord your God gives you. You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you every, uh, everyone who followed the Baal of Peor. But all of you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me to that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your, your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all the decrees and say, Surely this nation is a wise and understanding people. What of the nation is so great as to have their gods near in the way of, near them, I'm sorry, the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray. And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of law I am setting before you? Verse 9, only be careful. And watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. For the sake of time, I'll not read the next passage, but if you're taking notes, jot down Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. And once again, the Lord talks about loving and serving God with all of our heart. Again, in these few moments, I want to talk about the preservation of the heart. Someone defined the heart or the way it's used in Scripture as such. Heart is used in Scripture as the most comprehensive term for the authentic person. It is the part of our being where we desire, where we deliberate, where we decide. It has been described as the place of conscious and decisive spiritual activity, the comprehensive term for a person as a whole, his feelings, desires, passions, thought, understanding, and will, and the center of a person. The place to which God turns. Listen again to a brief summation of the same. Heart, the way it's used in Scripture, talks about the authentic person. This is who we really are. It's not the external presence or performance or facade or even if the expressions are real. The Bible tells us that what really defines us is what we call the heart. It's the center of the person. It's the place where God looks I want to highlight for us tonight just a few things, again, that I'm referring to as the preservation of the heart. There are several things we, I'd want to share with you. The Bible talks about the heart being. There are many. We could be here literally for hours tonight if we explored them all. I just want to tell you one. I'll tell you what I'm not going to tell you tonight because I had three things to share with you, but we're not going to get to that. 
the heart, what we want to talk about in these moments is that the heart is the testament of one's true character. So it's very important, is, again, if we hear the words of the writer of Proverbs, above everything else, guard your heart. It is the testament of one's true character. What we won't discuss tonight is the fact that your heart is the target of one's true enemy. If the adversary of our soul is looking for a place to target, it's our heart and our mind, and that's the playground he wants to come against, but we won't have time to explore that tonight, maybe sometime in the not-too-distant future. Thirdly, the heart is the tangible measure of one's true love and of one's true loyalties. Far beyond our words is what comes from the heart. But tonight, let's go back to this idea of the testament of one's true character. A testament is a strong evidence for something. So we look at tonight this issue of the heart as defined by Scripture as a strong evidence of a person's true character. The Bible has a great deal, a great deal to say about the heart. Let me give you a few things. Jesus said, for out of the overflow or the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When I hear somebody just lacerate somebody with their tongue and they say, oh, I didn't mean it, good chance they did. Jesus said it's from the abundance of one's heart that the mouth speaks, whether it's words of kindness or words of corruption. We can never, ever think that the words that we share, the words that we use, the language that we use, the tone that we use with one another, we can never ever say as believers that that's not important because I don't think the Son of God would agree with that. We find these words in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. When it comes to the heart, and again we hearken back to the words of the writer of Proverbs, the heart has always been the center point of God's focus, as we have just read. And again, we could be here for hours looking at portions of Scripture that deal with how God focuses on the heart. It's always been the center point of God's God's focus. The heart has always been the seat of man's true disclosure. Our truest disclosure is not just in our words. Yes, they come from our heart, but our truest disclosure is what's on the inside. I'm going to show you this from Scripture in just a few minutes. The heart has also always been the place or the home of one's genuine transformation. When it comes to the transformation of the life of a believer, we're not talking about just behavior modification. Well, I'm just going to stop doing that. Bad boy, don't do that again. It's not that. It's a transformation from the inside out. That the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed and metamorphosized by the renewing of one's mind. Where does that take place? In the mind, in the heart, in the deepest part of us. That part of us that defines who we are, that part of us that always has the attention of our Heavenly Father. It is the place where one's character is shaped or molded. It is the place where one's character, or from which one's character, is always revealed. Among the many things that we could talk about in terms of the heart, regarding it being the testament of one's character, Let me share with you just three things that we find in Scripture when it talks about things that are revealed from the heart, character issues that are revealed, can be revealed from the heart. Proverbs, um, yes, Proverbs 23, verse 7. Let me read it to you first in the King James. King James says this, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Traditionally, and not Really inappropriately, we look at that and say, well, what's on the man's, what's in his mind, that, that's who he really is. And that's not entirely untrue, biblically. It really is true. It's just not what the author of Proverbs was getting at in this verse. Again, the principle is true, and I believe Scripture endorses that. What the writer of Proverbs was getting at was something a little bit different, a little bit clearer. It, it, under the umbrella of it, it covers what we just said. It's a little bit broader than that. In order for us to really understand what this verse means, then we need to consider not just verse 7. Again, King James is a man thing of in his heart, so is he. 
We need to go and look at the verses that sandwich that verse together. So we go back and look at verses 6, 7, and 8, and this is what it says. Let me read it from the NIV. It says, Do not eat the food of a stingy man. Do not crave his delicacies. For he is the kind of man who is always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the little you have eaten and have wasted your compliments. This passage talks about a stingy or a, a miserly man. But what it does is what it reveals in verse 7 is what we're looking at. Not just he stingy or miserly, but listen to what it says. Let me read verse 7 again from the NIV. For he is the kind of man who is always thinking about the cost. King James, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What is this verse actually getting at? This verse really reveals the hidden calculations of his heart. As a man thinketh, the word literally means as a man calculates in his heart, in that deepest part of him. So what we have in this passage is, is the revelation of someone's heart, the calculations of a person's heart, which is far more important than the disingenuous expressions of their mouth. What we're talking about here is the calculating heart. Okay, let me make it very, very clear. I need a volunteer. Okay, Nicholas. Nicholas and I go out. No, no, I don't, need, I don't need to stand up. I just need to pick on somebody. So Nicholas and I go out to, to lunch. He says, hey, let, let's go out to lunch. This is on me. I want you to get anything you want. Pick any place you want. So I pick a place that's kind of moderately priced and you know, I, think, well, I really would like to get that, but my nature would be, no, that's going to cost too much. And Nicholas keeps saying, oh, man, just go ahead, do whatever you want. You know, sky's the limit. And that's what he's saying. Eat, drink, be happy, fill up. You know, if you want dessert, get two. But what he's thinking of in his heart is, he better look at that dollar menu. <laughs> because I do have the money to pay for it every day. But I'm not spending it on him, and I'm not spending it today. I've got flowers to buy for Anna. And at the same time, he's thinking, I was like, come on, Pastor, just, you have to have the largest steak they have here. Eats. But his heart is not with me. And the Bible tells, not figuratively, I'm not going to go in the parking lot and throw up. But figuratively speaking, you will vomit that which was there, and you will have wasted your compliments. Because what he said to me was disingenuous. Eat all you want. Do all you want. But as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. In his heart, he is stingy, he is miserly, and he does not want. Somebody said of my grandfather, he could squeeze the buffalo off a of nickel. I mean, and that's tight. So Nicholas is out there. You know, he's, he's telling me to get whatever I want. He's got a nickel in his pocket. And all of a sudden, you hear that buffalo go, you know, because, you know, this is the picture. This literally is the picture he's talking about. So he's talking about the person who says one thing, but in their heart, their calculations is entirely different than what they're saying. And that's what he talks about. So the Bible talks about the capability of a person in their heart being very calculating, says all the right things, smiles, and, and, but none of it is really true. That's one of the things that can happen in the heart, according to the writer of Proverbs. A second Thing we look at in terms of the heart is the deceptive heart. I'll get to the good news in a moment. The deceptive heart, the Bible talks about that. Psalm 55, verses 20 and 21. My compassion, I'm sorry, my companion attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. King James puts it this way when it talks about my companion, that he puts forth his hand against his friends. He violates his covenant or his alliances. His speech is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. He's talking about the capability here of one whose words are smooth as butter, but in their heart there's war. 
And using the words of Scripture, in the heart there is deception, there is fraud, there is misrepresentation, there is betrayal. This is what the Scripture is talking about. It breaks covenants and is war in the words. Now, does this ever happen? Let me give you three examples, and I'll just tell you what they are because you're familiar with all of them. This is what we see in the case of Jacob and Esau. There was deception. Words said one thing to his dying father, but his heart said something very different. Words said one thing to his brother, but his heart said something very, very different. And he had his mother as his compatriot in all of this. That was something deceptive. There was a deceptive heart. In the case of Samson and Delilah, oh, I love your hair. Well, what can I do? How can I make you weak? Well, you know, if you do this, it'll happen. And, oh, Samson, you lied to me. Okay, well, this is what you really do. And you know the count. And finally, he just flirted with anointing that he had. Didn't take it as seriously or make it as precious as he should have. And he told the secret to this person who was deceiving him the entire time. I don't care how much she bat her eyes at him. She was trying. She was telling him, I want, I want to hurt you. I want to take your strength. This was a deceptive heart. We look at the case of King David and his relationship with Uriah. Bathsheba was pregnant. It was Uriah's wife. Bring him home from the field so he can sleep with his wife and hopefully she'll get pregnant and we can play it off as is his. And you know the rest of the account. Uriah slept outside the gate. He said, I can't do that when my, my men are out in the field in war. So he got him drunk the next night and he still wouldn't do it. So he killed him. Deceptive heart. This is what the scripture talks about. But let me give you the good news. And I'm going to do this very quickly. Let me give you the good news. The Bible doesn't just talk about a calculating heart, and there are many more than these three. It doesn't just talk about a deceptive heart. And why do I tell you those negative sides? Because any human being has the capability of succumbing to those things. Any one of us can be calculating. Our words are going a mile a minute, but inside we're thinking something entirely different. And according to the writer of Proverbs, while my words are saying the right thing, my heart is not really with you. We must guard our hearts so that we as believers don't find ourselves falling prey to being calculating in our hearts, saying things a mile a minute, but we know we don't mean it. We have the capability of being deceptive in our hearts. But the third thing I would give you tonight, the Bible talks about the heart that follows hard after God. Let me give you a few references for this. Psalm 7. And I want us to look at David. David had a great deal to say about the heart. And even though he was one who made his share of mistakes, David knew how to worship. David knew how to repent. David says this in Psalm 7, verse 10. He said, my shield is God most high, who saves the upright in heart. Psalm 57, verse 7. He said, my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is is steadfast. King James says this, my heart is fixed. And that's a good translation of this word. The word steadfast, he means fixed or established or is made firm. I'm not wishy-washy in my walk with God. I've made up my mind. My heart is steadfast. And in case God didn't hear him the first time, he repeats again, my heart is steadfast. Oh, God. There's a chorus we used to sing years ago. It says, my mind's made up. My heart is fixed. I'm going with Jesus All the way. That principle was taken directly from this passage in the Word of God. He says, My heart is fixed. It's fixed. It's locked in. So, God, I'm not serving you just as a fair weather disciple when things are going really well. Oh, praise God. I love serving God. But the moment things happen the way that I didn't want them to, God, I didn't bargain for all this. And if you don't turn things around, I got better things to do with my time. That's not the deal. He said, My heart is fixed. My heart is established. My heart is firm. In my convictions and in my relationship with Almighty God. Psalm 51, verses 10 and 17. He talked not only about the upright heart or a heart that is steadfast, but he said, Create in me a pure heart or a clean heart, O God, and renew, here's the word again, a steadfast spirit within me. In verse 17, he says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken spirit. And contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. 
Well, God wants us to be brokenhearted. God wants us to be, man, if I'm sad and forlorn, then that really means I'm godly. That is not what this verse is saying at all. The idea behind verse 17, and it's, it, it repeats, two different Hebrew words, it repeats it because it's driving home a point and a principle. The words almost overlap. They carry a very similar meaning, and that was intentional, I believe, in the heart of the writer of this psalm. The idea behind verse 17 is this. It talks about the heart that should deeply feel its transgressions and then turn with fullness to God in repentance. It's not the person who says, I sinned, and hey, psh, everybody does. You know, God just knows, that's me. And, and it's not the deal at all. He talks about the broken heart, the contrite heart before the Lord. There's what I, I often refer to as a safe place, and many talk about that, but let me tell you what three things that I identify as being a safe place or some qualities of a safe place. And it would take some time to really explain. So let me just mention these three things. Uh, some qualities of a safe place. One, it eliminates secrecy. It overcomes shame. And it guarantees privacy. In that safe place, you can deal with life. You can play hardball with life. The celebratory things, the broken moments. But in those places, we're able to come before God. With our hearts, with our grief, even in those safe places. Let me pick on Nicholas again. Let's say Nicholas is a safe place for me, and I'm really going through it. I'm struggling in my walk. I'm struggling in my faith. I'm struggling with sin. Nicholas, can we talk? And he says, sure. And I believe this is a safe place. But that doesn't mean it's a place where Nicholas is going to let me off a hook. I can share. I can open my heart. But if I need to be nailed to the wall, it's coming. So it doesn't mean that in that safe place, because I know it's a safe place, he's going to pacify my brokenness or pacify my sin. It does mean he's going to stick with me to see me get it back on track. This is what the Lord's talking about. And listen to who said it. David said it. David was in the, David, you know the account. This is when he was confronted by Nathan. And Nathan said, you're the guy who's done this. So he says, create me a clean heart, O God. And then he says, God delights in a broken heart, a contrite spirit. God delights in the fact, very simply, that when I sin, I'm not dragging myself through the mud and, oh, I'm just a horrible person. None of that stuff at all. But God delights in the fact that I'm fully aware of my sin and I'm broken in the presence of Almighty God. But that's not where I stay. In my brokenness, I come before God and I repent. God, the Bible says, this kind of heart, God does not despise. Because I realize my own Fragile nature in the presence of a holy and sovereign God. That's a heart that is in pursuit of Almighty God. Listen to what David again said. Psalm 32. I just want to read two verses. Verses 3 and 4. He said, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through, through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. David knew how to grieve over sin. David knew how to repent. He said, your hand was just pressing in on me. My bones ached. This is what he's getting at in Psalm 51. That brokenness before God. But aren't you grateful for the forgiveness of Christ? Because God's desire is not to break us and keep us broken. It's that we recognize our brokenness so we can come to him for his forgiveness and cleansing and strength so we don't keep staying broken in the presence of Almighty God. This delights the heart of God. I'm going to ask Joe to come back. Joe and Nancy, I want to close with this. When we think of these things, this idea of a heart that presses hard after God, what was the old chorus we sing? A heart that follows hard after you. A pure heart. Do you know, know that one? That's what I long for. A heart that follows hard after thee. This is what it comes from. A pure heart. No wonder the writer of the Proverbs said, above everything, guard your heart. Let me close with this. The word guard here means several things. You know, most Hebrew and Greek words have many meanings. 
It carries, among many things, the idea of preserve. And that's why I call this the preservation of the heart. Preserve your heart. Protect your heart. Observe your heart. Keep your heart. If the heart, the language of scripture is that the heart is at the seat of who we are. And what identifies us is who we are. And the writer of Proverbs picks up the stylus and says, above everything else. He said, get wisdom with all you're getting understanding. Whatever it costs, get understanding. But above everything else, protect your heart. For from it are the issues of life. So tonight I want to encourage us as believers, as we read, and I trust you're reading with us in Proverbs, then continue, and then we finish that actually the 1st of September, and then we roll into Romans, and we look forward to that also, to understanding what the Lord is saying to us. But I'll leave you with this tonight again. Above everything else, protect your heart, for that's the place that issues life, your life, the life of the Lord transmitting through you and through me. Guard your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, O oh God, tonight for your word. Grateful for your presence, O oh God. Grateful for the instructions. And God, we hear the admonition of the writer of the Proverbs tonight. Help us, God, to be diligent, diligent to guard, observe, protect our hearts, to preserve our hearts. So the God where you look, not on the outward appearance, but at the heart, it's there that we hear you say to us, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. So God, help us to do that, I pray. And as we do it, may we do it all to the glory of God. And we seal this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Joe's going to lead us in worship. I'm going to ask you to stand. And after we worship the Lord for a while, then we're going to share some fellowship outside. We've got some delicious ice cream and even more delicious fellowship. And then as you go tonight, please go knowing that God loves you and so do we. Let's turn our hearts toward the Lord in worship. Holy, there is no one like you. And there is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show stand in awe of you, O Holy One. We thank you, Lord God, that we could gather together. Now, as we go about the rest of this evening, may we surrender all to you, God. 
We love you and praise you every day forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. All of God's people said, amen and amen. New Life Church, go knowing that God loves you and so do we. We will see you on Sunday.